Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the class uh, engineering statistics again. So in the previous lectures, we talked about confidence intervals and uh, in particular we focused on how to construct confidence intervals using hypothesis test and then we talked about uh, various tests based on p-values. So in particular, we talked about uh, p-values, p-test, t-test and f-test. Now in this lecture, we are going to continue our discussion of test of a hypothesis. But now we will focus on something called non-parametric estimation. That means the one which does not need to make any assumption about the statistics we are going to use to make our uh, decision either to accept or uh, reject our null hypothesis. And then we will talk about various uh, goodness of fit test for this non-parametric estimation. In particular, we are going to talk about three goodness of fit test. First one is chi-square distribution, chi-square test, then colmo gross pirnau test and then really force test. Okay, let's get started with what we mean by this non-parametric estimation. So the statistical methods we use so far assume the knowledge of the population's distributions and uh, that too we assume they are parameterized. For example, we assume that the sample we have, we assume that this is where xi's are going to come from a certain distribution with the parameter theta and then we set up our tests as whether this theta is certain particular value like is this theta corresponds to certain 30 and particular theta naught or, or not. Okay, and we did that using hypothesis testing. And in hypothesis testing, if you recall, we defined something called power function, which was like a beta of a theta that is defined as probability that my sample uh, belongs to uh, my rejection region. So, where R is the rejection region, uh, for example, R could uh, come from your uh, log likelihood ratio test which defined it like this. But notice that to compute these probabilities, we explicitly needed know this particular distribution and this probability was calculated under the parameter theta and when we try to give uh, alpha level test, we try to find something like this belongs to null hypothesis, right? If you, I'm, I hope you people all uh, recall this discussions we had. So in computing all this, we kind of explicitly needed to know the underlying distribution and uh, this, the probability of something falling under this uh, region R, we calculated using the knowledge of this particular distribution. And we also looked into various statistics, like for example, we used statistics to do t-test and f-test, but uh, in doing t-test, for example, if you recall the t-test, we had something like uh, x bar, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think we had something like x x bar and uh, sigma square n. This is, uh, we assumed it to be Gaussian distributed, right, which was the case when it was, uh, when the samples are already coming from the Gaussian distribution. But we assume that this statistic is uh, Gaussian distributed. Right, or uh, or when the sigma square 
is not known, we looked into the case when this statistic says student t distributed. Okay, so we kind of enforced some distribution on the statistic itself, which we used to make our a decision, right? But now the question is, what if we don't want to enforce any distribution on the statistics beforehand? That is, what if my underlying distributions are not Gaussian? Okay, and uh, do I still need to make this dis uh, dis make uh, this assumption always to apply this test? Or put alternatively, if I want to do certain these of this test, I am invariably making this assumption that the underlying samples are coming from Gaussian distribution. But then how to check that indeed the samples are coming from Gaussian distributions for that itself we need a test, right? So thinking all of this, we need a method where to know the distribution of the statistics, we don't need to know the underlying distribution of the uh, samples itself. Okay. So, keeping this in mind, what we have so far discussed is all these hypothesis testing, T test, F test, these are called parametric method because they explicitly made use of the properties of the underlying distribution or the parameters of the underlying distribution. And uh, in this, at least in the T test and F test, they kind of assume that uh, normality assumption work, uh, holds. But uh, this is true only when we have large number of samples and in, in that case my statistics which was of the form uh, x bar, we, we could be think of following uh, Gaussian distribution using our uh, central limit theorem. But however, this is not the case uh, when we have small number of samples and uh, that is why before we are going to apply any of the hypothesis testing uh, F test or T test that we used before, we need to validate that the assumptions we are making on the underlying uh, distributions of the sample is correct. So, to do that itself, we need to have some statistics whose distribution itself does not depend on the distribution of the sample. If that is the case, then we are going to call them as non-parametric method. or distribution free methods. Okay, distribution, sorry, I want to, I meant here distribution free methods. Okay, okay, now, suppose we want to check whether uh, observed samples are going to follow certain distributions, then we need to have, have certain tests to check whether they follow the given hypothesis or uh, distribution uh, which is taken as null hypothesis and uh, those tests we are going to now call it as goodness of test. Basically, we are going to say that the samples we are going to observe are they going to follow given distribution and uh, we want to check the goodness of that fit. Now in that regard, like assume that or like let us say your underlying population distribution unknown and uh, we want to check if the data follows a hypothesis distribution which I am going to denote as F0. So now the goal itself is like earlier when I have this samples, I kind of assumed FIs are going to follow certain uh, PD, uh, PDF or let us say uh, some parametric CDF. Now I am going to assume that this itself is not known. I want to check this itself and uh, that I am going to denote it as F of 0 here. Now then what is my hypothesis now? Now my hypothesis test, my test can be now posed as that my CDF 
is that of F0, which I am hypothesizing it to be, and this holds for all possible values of x. And the alternative hypothesis is at least it differs at one point. That is, my distribution of the data points is not same as the null, hypo null hypothesis distribution at at least one point. Now, this hypothesis distribution now can be this hypothesis distribution can be either completely self specified with all the parameters. For example, this F0 could be associated with a probability density function which is Gaussian with parameter mu and sigma square here. The parameters of the distributions are completely specified or it could be told that like our uh, null hypothesis is a Poisson distribution with a parameter lambda. Or it may happen that this hypothesis distribution is only specified in terms of its shape. For example, we only know that this is the hi null hypothesis is a Gaussian distribution, that is it. We do not know what are the parameters or we may be just told that it is Poisson distribution without specifying what the parameter is. Now, how to go about that? How to go about uh, checking whether my samples follow this null hypothesis? For that, we are going to see majorly two tests, one for discrete random variables and another for the continuous random variables. In the discrete random variables, we are going to use something called chi-square test, which is proposed by one of the famous mathematician called Pearson uh, in I think early 800s. So in this, uh, what we are going to do is compare the observed frequencies with that of the expected frequencies under null hypothesis. And as I said, this will be used mostly for the discrete populations. Okay. And another test, again um, introduced by famous mathematician, mathematicians are, and also statisticians, Kolmogorov and Smirnov, um, and uh, a variant of that by Lily Force. So here, we are going to compare observed cumulative relative frequencies with that expected under the null hypothesis. So notice that here we are trying to compare the frequencies of the uh, classes. I will make it a bit clear and here we are going to compare the cumulative relative frequencies of, uh, of the distributions. Okay, so, we are going to uh, compare cumulated relative frequencies okay? and uh, this Kolmogorov, Spirnov and Lily force test usually is going to apply it for continuous population density and uh, more specifically Lily force will be applied to check whether the underlying uh, population is a Gauss Gaussian distributed. Okay, now, let us focus on the chi square test. Now, our we want to test whether my observed data follows a given discrete population, which I denote as F0 and we are going to assume that that is completely specified. For example, if it is a Gaussian, uh, sorry, we are talking about a discrete here, maybe this F0 uh, uh, my distributions can be Poisson with lambda. So, here I am specifying the parameter or it could be uh, let us say binomial with parameter n and p where both n and p are specified. Now, in this case, if I am given a data, I want to check whether it follows this CDF. How I am going to do that? To do this, I am going to group my data into k classes. What are these k classes? For example, let us say that my random variable x is there which is going to take values 1, 2 up to k. Okay? So then there are k classes or may, my random variables is that it may just take value like uh, head or tail, head or tail. So, in this case, my k is going to be 2. These are the two classes. And similarly, if it is uh, 
uh, let's say dice, you have obviously uh, six faces in which my k is going to be six like that. Now, what I'll be interested in the expected frequency of the class i. Suppose I have this Poisson distribution. Let's take Poisson distribution. Let's say my x is Poisson distributed. Now I know that x is going to take the value. Uh, x is going to take the value 0, 1, 2, 3, like this. Or maybe a poison instead of poison. Let's take uh, maybe at this point it's easier to work with binomial. Let's say my x is binomial distributed, and uh, um, and I have let's say the samples, n samples, and I know that probability that x going to take value some i is going to be n choose i. Uh, p to the power i minus i and uh, 1 minus p to the power n minus i. Let us call this as theta. So, this is the probability of observing value i and then my samples the expected frequency of observing class i is in this case is going to be n of theta that is if I have n samples the expected frequency of observing the class i is going to be n i in this case, right. So, that is what I mean by e i here. And now, f i is the observed frequency. What is this uh, uh, observed frequency? Like, uh, now, now let me write this observed frequency here. This f i is basically how many times you have observed maybe I will write it as j uh, or maybe it is ok to write i, but uh, maybe f i is equal to basically j equals to 1 to uh, observe j indicator that your x j is equals to 1. So, it is basically counting how many times you have observed uh, sorry this is i here observe your uh, random variable has taken value i out of your n samples. So, this is your observed frequency of class i and this is the expected frequency of your uh, class i under your uh, null hypothesis. So, notice that under null hypothesis because my null hypothesis is completely specified I know what are these theta. Now, comes the statistic. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to check how far this f i and e i s are. So, we are going to look into the dif different their difference and take the square of that that is basically the square difference of that and normalize them by their expected frequency and then sum it over all the possible classes. So, this is way in a way this matrix is going to capture how different the expected frequencies and the observed frequencies are. Now, naturally once we have this, if this difference is too large, it is kind of indication that maybe uh, these what is my observed sample is not following the null hypothesis. On the other hand, if this difference is small or this uh, summed difference is small, then it is a kind of indication that yes maybe um, uh, it is like uh, it is a kind of indication that my observed samples are following my uh, null hypothesis distribution. So, based on this distribution one can compute or make a decision whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis. So, as we did earlier again we can set up a threshold and uh, let us say for a given threshold z alpha we are going to accept the null hypothesis if this statistic is going to be less than or equals to z alpha and we are going to reject this h0 if it is larger than certain this threshold z alpha. Now, the question is can we quantify 
like how good or bad is our acceptance decision. So now we may want to compute what is the probability that I reject my sample. Okay, can we compute this probability? Okay, and uh, that under a null hypothesis. So this is uh, uh, we want to quantize and if you are able to say that this is like less than or equals to some number uh, then that is going to give me uh, uh, the significance of this test with that number. Now then the question is uh, how to compute this probabilities do we know about this distribution. Earlier when we talked about uh, hmm, hypothesis testing we kind of assumed this, this statistics we assumed its distribution right we, we enforced its uh, distributions to follow Gaussian distribution or to compute its distribution we needed to know the distribution of the underlying uh, uh, samples. But now in this case I am only looking into the empirical values of fi see here q is still a random quantity because this fi's are random here ok. Now will I be do I need to know the underlying distribution of my samples to compute the distribution or I can say without knowing that. It so happens that in this case we do not need to know the distribution of the underlying samples and in fact one can argue that this q is roughly distributed as chi squared it has this q has chi square distribution with k minus degrees of freedom right so we will we will discuss more about that why this is the case but uh, notice that without requiring what is the underlying distribution of my samples i can argue that this q is going to satisfy chi square distribution with k minus of degree freedom now once I have this I should be able to uh, quantify the significance or the level of my test by setting my threshold appropriately particularly an approximate alpha level test is obtained by rejecting your null hypothesis when your q is larger than 1 minus alpha th quartile point of the chi square distribution or like uh, if you are if you want this uh, alpha test we need to set z alpha such that your p of x uh, is greater than z alpha is alpha where your x is chi square distribution with k minus degrees of freedom and since we know this uh, chi square distributions well we can compute its uh, tail probabilities and tabulate them and for a given value of alpha we already know how we should be selecting z alpha so that my test is uh, has a alpha level significance or uh, it my, my test is uh, uh, is a alpha level test ok. So good now what we have argued is without knowing the distribution of the underlying samples we are able to say that my statistic has chi square distribution and uh, we can use uh, readily available table to compute the significance uh, or the level of my, my test or how should I set up my threshold so that my test achieves a given significance level. Now this test works well when or like this approximation that your q is going to follow chi square distribution with k minus of degrees freedom well when the expected frequencies are more than phi that is when your ei is greater than 1 for all the classes ok. This need not be the case all, all the time but uh, this is a kind of thumb rule uh, which will uh, uh, can be used when you have uh, when you want your approximation to be good like for example we said that ei is going to be n into probability that your random variable takes value i equals to n right. So whatever this this 
this is like theta i this is known under your null hypothesis if your n is such that your it makes your ai larger than phi then this is a very good approximation now composite distribution as i said every time the null hypothesis may not be completely specified only the shape may be given in that case we call the distribution is composite and now how to go about in this case now in this case let theta i's are the probabilities of the class now because the underlying parameters uh, of the distribution is known we don't know this theta i exactly so what i mean by this suppose for example if x is poisson distributed we know that probability that x equals to i in this case theta i is equals to e to the power minus lambda i hope i'm going to make it correct uh, and this is i lambda but so to compute this theta i i need the knowledge of lambda but what if i don't know this so in this case you may estimate this lambda itself from the data that is if you have your samples you can estimate your lambda to be the empirical mean of this data and we know that uh, this is a good estimator it is an unbiased asymptotically it is consistent and all and uh, and then once we have this we can plug in this uh, lambda i's in this expression here and then you may get lambda hat lambda hat i and i hat and that's what i'm going to call it as a theta i here based on this estimate now once i have this now i can also get an estimated frequencies which is now theta i hat now all i need to do is <coughs> for my given um, ei values now I need to compute my statistic which is same uh, maybe I had to write this as fi I think earlier I wrote this as small fi and uh, I have this value only thing is I have replaced this uh, e by n theta hat 0 subscript i here now what about the distribution of key q does it follow the same distribution like we had earlier like which is a chi square distribution with k minus 1 degrees of freedom it so happens that when the parameters that you are going to estimate are based on maximum likelihood estimator then indeed one can argue that q still remains chi squarely has maintains chi square distribution the only thing is now the degrees of freedom is now k minus 1 minus s okay now what is this s here earlier it was k minus 1 now you are saying it is k minus 1 minus s now here s is the number of distributions parameter that we estimated for example here right in the poison we estimated one parameter right in this case if you have to um, apply this method um, okay so then let's say uh, we we have observed only some uh, k like even though there are infinitely many classes in this uh, poisson distribution because uh, k uh, the x can take value from 0 to infinity let's say you have in the samples that we have observed in this i have only see certain k number of possible classes uh, they belongs to let's say only k classes so in that case my k minus 1 and minus one more term one is going to come because i have estimated one more parameter so this is going to be k minus 2 in this case okay so um, let's uh, stop here and uh, then let's continue how is k is indeed chi square distribution with a rough rule sketch